this great tragedy, we watched the New Yorker shout amongst the rubble of the World Trade Center, USA, USA. And we saw Democrats and Republicans joining hands together on the Capitol steps in unity. Today, the Tallahassee Boys Choir continues to send out our thoughts and our prayers to the victims of the World Trade Center, the United States Pentagon, and Flights 11, 77, 93, and 175. We also send out our thoughts and prayers to our brave men and women who are fighting for our freedom over in Iraq, Afghanistan, and all across this globe. We hope that you will keep us in your prayers as we continue to let freedom ring through song. God bless the United States of America. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose bright stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red red the bombs bursting in So well, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here this evening. As you look around, you will notice that we are a packed house. Uh, this year's dinner is a remarkable event for any number of reasons, not the least of which is the fact that we have over 500 guests here. That's right. I think that is in part a testament to the unique events surrounding the Florida Supreme Court this year and the wonderful keynote speaker that we have here today, Mr. Ted Olson. So I'm going to introduce your Master of Ceremonies for this evening. There's an adage that says, if something ain't broke, you don't fix it. Of course, that doesn't eliminate the fear that I have in presenting Hank Cox to you. <laughs> Hank has graciously emceed this event for a number of years. The repercussions we are still dealing with. So I will step aside and invite Hank, where are you? This is his joke now, he's gonna disappear. Hank, where are you? There he is, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, Hank Cox, your MC. Thank you, Ed. It's, it's nice to be back. For those of you who looked in the program and have heard before, the mission is to get everyone out on time. What you don't see in the program, and probably not aware, this organization has only presented five Lifetime Achievement Awards in its existence. I intend to present eight more. <laughs> and the reason I plan to do that is because we have seven justices, sitting justices here tonight. Every one of them, in my opinion, has done a remarkable job and is worthy of a Lifetime Achievement Award tonight and I'm worthy of the eighth. Uh, I understand, and I know the governor's present, term limits can have harsh consequences. People have to leave and move on. And it's been a tough 
tough result of term limits for Gray Robinson. We understand that. Uh, you don't see any, it's probably half the people here are probably from Gray Robinson. Uh, but be that as it may, I want to read something to change, change the tone a little bit. This is from Susan Rosenblatt. For those of you who don't know Susan Rosenblatt, Susan is the president-elect of the Historical Society, and I think in the judgment of all trustees of the society, has been the greatest benefactress and supporter of this society in modern times. So this is difficult. Dear Hank, this is a sad message. Two weeks ago, I was diagnosed with MDS. I am asymptomatic with lower than usual labs followed by a bone marrow test. I need chemotherapy followed by a bone marrow transplant. There are different treatment options, all frightening and high risk, and I'm truly overwhelmed, but as you know, I am a fighter. Stanley and I are sadly missing, missing the society yearly dinner tomorrow, but among other issues I want everyone to know is that I love the society and I love the justices of the Florida Supreme Court. I believe in the power of prayer and ask that you explain my situation at the dinner and ask the audience to keep me in their prayers and also to join the stem cell registry. A life saved may be mine or a close friend or a loved one or a close friend of someone in the audience. All my love and best wishes, Susan Rosenblatt and of course, Stanley. So with that, let me move on to a little different to move it along. I'd like to bring a longtime friend of mine up here and someone who's been a longtime friend of everyone in this audience. He may have been my friend longer than anyone else. When he was chief judge of the Fourth Judicial Circuit and I was a young assistant state attorney, I babysat his three children repeatedly <laughs> for two reasons. Number one, you don't say no to the chief judge, even though I was a lawyer at the time. And number two, Major Harding genuinely believed that if you were single, you had nothing to do on the weekends. <laughs> That's how straight Major Harding was. So it is my privilege to introduce Major Harding to deliver the invocation. Thank you, Hank. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come with grateful hearts for the opportunity to gather and celebrate not only the freedoms and liberties we enjoy as citizens of this great nation and state, but to honor the lives of those who have served and presently work uh, to preserve the freedoms and liberties. We pray for the well-being of those who've recently left the Supreme Court of Florida, Justice Lewis, Justice Perriente, Justice Quince, and for our new justices, Justice Logoa, Justice Luck, and Justice Menez. We ask a special blessing of health and comfort for Susan Rosenblatt, and we seek your blessings on all gathered here, and thank you for the food that we will eat the fellowship that we will share around these tables, and for the message we will hear from our honored speaker, Ted Olson. We make our prayer in your holy name. Amen. I have the distinct pleasure to introduce this evening a very, very special guest. He began his illustrious career obtaining an undergraduate degree with honors at Yale University. Fortunately, he saw the light and decided to attend Harvard Law School. Sorry, Mr. Chief Justice, I, my apologies. Where he again graduated with honors and earned a commission with the US Navy as a JAG officer. During his active duty service, he supported operations at the terrorist detention center in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and deployed to Iraq in support of the U.S. Navy SEAL mission in Fallujah, Ramadi, and the rest of the Al-Anbar province. He's the recipient of the Bronze Star Medal for Meritorious Service and the Iraq Campaign Medal. In 2012, he was first elected to Congress as a representative of Florida's 6th Congressional District and served until 2018. In the 30 days since being sworn in as governor, he has, among other things, begun tackling the environmental challenges the state of Florida is currently facing, 
has urged for the full implementation of the people's will in enacting the constitutional amendment supporting medical marijuana. And most germane to us here tonight, appointed three new justices to the Florida Supreme Court. I want to thank the governor for appointing my former associate to the court. I feel so young. <laughs> so, without further elaboration, it is my honor to present to you the governor of the great state of Florida, Ron DeSantis. Thank you. Thank you, great to be here. Thank you, please take a seat. It's great to be here. It's great to be here. We um, you know, do a lot and sometimes I'm in so many different cities and this morning we were at the state fair to start off at 6.30 and this, but all the stuff you see me doing out uh, outside, really the most hectic part of my day I just left from is when my wife and I get with our two little kids. We got a two year old daughter, a 10 month old son and really from 5.30 to around 7, 7.30 is very hectic. So I left her, my wife, with the two kids in the bathtub. They were having a great time, <laughs> but it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be uh, interesting. You know, we work really hard to baby-proof the governor's mansion, because they haven't had young kids, I think, since 1968. And we did this and the light socket, but these kids have an uncanny ability to just find new nooks and crannies. <laughs> And it's like you take your eye off them one, but they're, they're settling in good and we're having a good time. It's great to be here. Obviously, um, as, as the governor, given the fact that we had these three vacancies, it was a big part of, of what I conceived of my role coming in. And uh, I can't tell you whether the way Florida does judicial selection is better than a, an advice and consent if that were done more rationally like we see in Washington. But I can tell you it's definitely better than what I've seen lately in terms of the Supreme Court uh, selections and how that whole circus unfolds. And, and I basically got, as governor-elect, I got a, a sheet of 11 names and uh, we, my folks, started to vet uh, the names and do research, read their writings, do, do the whole nine yards. Uh, eventually, I had all 11 interview with kind of a panel of, uh, of lawyers that, that I trust, and uh, some of them are in this room, like our, our, our general counsel, Joe Jaco, Governor Scott's outgoing general counsel, you know, some other folks who have, who have uh, really been around the block, and they just peppered them with questions. And I wasn't present for this, but then we, we got a report, and, oh, this, this guy's this, this, the, all this. And so, uh, but I thought that it's important for me to actually talk to everyone, so then subsequent to that, I met with every one of them, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, all 11 of them, for, for between 20 and 45 minutes, so depending on, on, on how it went, and, um, and then we ended up doing the, the, the picks we did, which I'll talk about in a minute, but basically what I was looking for, obviously you want somebody that's smart, but you know, all people that were sent were, were smart, um, you know, someone that can write well, because you know, when you're on a court of last uh, uh, resort, uh, what you decide in a given case is obviously important, but you also want to do that in a way that's going to bring clarity to the law um, for, for future cases. And so I was looking at that. And then I wanted somebody who uh, conceived of judging the way Hamilton explained it in the Federalist Papers, that uh, a, a judge has neither force nor will, but merely judgment. And it's applying the judgment of what the law uh, is, what the Constitution is, uh, but never usurping a legislative function to change the law or interpret the law in a way uh, that the fair meaning, a plain meaning, or, or intent uh, would not allow. And so we were uh, looking for that. And part of the reason why I look for that is because I think if you believe in the separation of powers as the, as the foundation to our constitutional system, you really have to have uh, judges uh, performing their uh, duties in that, in that role. And um, you know, it's often said we have three co-equal branches of government. Um, I'm not sure that, at least on the federal constitution, that that's how the founders would have said it. I think if you read how they did it, they thought the judiciary would be the weakest, and they thought the Congress would be the strongest. And the reason is, is they enumerated way more powers for the Congress 
both in terms of the quality of the powers, but also the number. Uh, the president would be powerful depending on the circumstances. Um, and then the court had a very important, but it was, but it was a limited role. Um, having served in the Congress six years, I can tell you Congress has given away a lot of its power, and I think we're basically the weak, we, we, I, I, we, I'm not part of that anymore, I'm a recovering congressman, but, um, <laughs> but I think Congress is effectively the weakest branch. I mean, you know, you get into the Congress, particularly as a junior member, and, um, you know, you can either be on Fox News or CNN and, and kind of give interviews, but to really do anything is, is, is I think, few and far between. Um, and I think Congress has kind of done that to itself. So, but I think that is how, you know, you read Hamilton, you read this. So it's an important function, but it's gotta be limited. And when it is, you know, that really fortifies the separation of powers because if the legislature gets out of, out of whack and passes something that they don't have authority to do or they violate an express provision of the Constitution, then you can make that judgment. Um, and people then have confidence that you're doing it uh, based on law and not based on, on will. So, so that is how I looked at all the candidates. So I wanted ability, I wanted smarts, integrity, honesty. Uh, but they had, uh, and all of them basically, I think, agreed, or at least told me they agreed uh, with that, because I don't think it was a real mystery, kind of what I was looking for in terms of philosophy. Um, so so we, did the, we did all 11 of these interviews, uh, probably middle of December, so before Christmas, and um, I didn't tell anybody anything. I, I just wouldn't talk about it, because I knew if I told somebody, then blah, 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 people would start talking. So I said not a word about any of this. Um, the only thing I told my staff as we got closer to the swearing in, and I resolved I was not going to announce I was going to appoint someone before I was actually governor, because I just viewed that, I, look, I don't know what the opposition would be. I mean, we are in a very toxic climate, although I think in the state, it's much better at the state level than in Washington, and I've enjoyed working with a variety of people with different uh, parties and different philosophies, but um, I didn't know if I put someone out there, are they just going to get attacked for two or three weeks? So I was like, that's not smart. So, all right, so you wait till you get in. Well, I told my staff, I would say, the day after swearing in, we'll do a Supreme Court announcement in the morning, and then we will go to the panhandle for the hurricane. Um, I didn't tell them who, but didn't say anything. So we go, I get sworn in, give the speech, we do this lunch, we baptize my son at the governor's mansion after that. So my wife's getting ready for the inaugural ball, and I'm sitting there kind of waiting for her to get, and it's like 4.30, 5 o'clock, and it occurred to me, I've not told anybody who I'm going to appoint tomorrow, including the just, justice would be justice themselves. So I called Barbara and said, you know, if you can be there at 10, I'll put you on the Supreme Court. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so she, and, and, if you know Barbara, she is very, I mean, like she detail oriented, uh, you know, making sure she gets everything right, studies, reads. And so this was like a big, you know, she would have wanted more time ideally to prepare remarks. And all this. So we do this great event at the, at the Freedom Tower in Miami and uh, you know, she gives this great speech and here I am. I mean, I know she didn't have a lot of time to put that together. I think she was up till two or three in the morning, um, but it was really good and I thought, when you have somebody who's, who's very well respected, done great in the law, done great as a judge, uh, coming from uh, whose parents fled a society where there was no rule of law, um, I think she's somebody that has a special appreciation of why we need a, a strong rule of law. And so um, it was really an honor to be able to appoint her. I think she's, she's already done a great job as a judge and I was a justice. I think she'll, she'll do. Is Barbara here tonight? Oh. Oh, hey. <laughs> and so, and I didn't tell anybody else about any of the other ones either because it actually didn't leak and all this other stuff. And um, so then the next one, you know, with Justice Luck, I did call him and gave him a little bit more lead time. I think I was like, next Monday, I called him at the end of the week, next Monday I'll put you on the court. Um, and I was like, but don't tell anyone. To his credit, it did not leak, nobody knew um, or anything. But you know, the thing about uh, Luck was just how people who had worked with him, it didn't even matter their political persuasion, anything. They just like, this guy's off the charts, he's, he's super smart, integrity, honorable. And I think, you know, you discuss the law with them, you sit there, 
And this is somebody that, I mean, he was born to be a judge. He loves this stuff. And um, I think he's gonna, gonna do a tremendous job. And um, you know, he's only not even 40 years old. Um, he's already on the highest court. Uh, some of us takes us till we're 40 to be able to win a win a big office or serve in a big position. But you know, whatever. So he, um, so he was somebody who I did not know before this process or really hadn't heard of, um, but was really striking. Just the number. I mean. The people that interviewed him saying, I'm in like the White House and people are bumping into me up there saying, hey, Luck is a good, good, good guy. All this just you couldn't it didn't matter um, where. And so so it was really great. And we got to do the announcement um, at his uh, at his kid's school, although he's got to figure out, is he going to move to Tallahassee commute? Um, but it was a real, I think, special moment. Then he gave a, you know, a really good speech um, as well. But, you know, Barbara only had a few hours and he did have four or five days. So it was a little bit different. <laughs> And then the good thing about uh, Justice Muniz was he's from Tallahassee. So in between those selections, uh, we happened to be, and the attorney general of our state was traveling with me on this plane that I'm, dry, I'm flying on right now. And we're going down to Fort Lauderdale for a different function. And um, all of a sudden, like, the masks fall down from the plane. They're, like, telling us to breathe in these masks. So I have Ashley Moody huffing into this. I'm huffing into it. And they're like, oh, we got to land. So it's like a surprise landing in St. Pete and this and that. And so, you know, I was just, I didn't have reliable transportation. And so I was like, I'm doing the next one at the governor's mansion. I'm not going to travel it on site. So it was perfect that he happens to live in Tallahassee. And his family was there and everything. And um, I, uh, but, but uh, you know, Carlos, so again, I took this seriously. If you, if, you, if you were somebody who was deputy general counsel to Jeb Bush, I called Jeb and asked. Or if you work for Pam, um, I would call Pam. And um, you know, not only did they provide positive feedback, but just saying how, I don't think I've ever, they're like, I don't think I've ever seen anyone smarter than him in the law. Um, and they've been around a lot, of, a lot of really good people. And um, I think you see that when you talk to them and you understand um, that, that this is a guy that is very, very well grounded. He understands kind of the constitutional foundations. And he's had to think about these things in a variety of different contexts, not just or not even because he's, he's coming from practice as a judge, but being in the legislative branch, being in the various parts of our executive branch here in Florida with a plural executive. So I think he brings a lot of knowledge to state government. Now, I've told the Chief Justice this, that because the Chief Justice went to Yale Law School, Carlos went to Yale Law School, and guys like me who look up to people like Judge Bork, Judge Bork said the way to save America was to close Yale Law School because <laughs> they are producing all these liberal law, you know, and they are dominating all the law schools and the judges. So I was like, I got two Yaleys on a seven member, but I think it's going to be fine. And I think... Uh, <laughs> I think, I think Carlos is going to do, going to do very, very well. So, um, so the process here in Florida, uh, to me was great. Um, I really, I put a lot of time into it. I really enjoyed meeting with everybody and some of the folks who were on the list that didn't make it, I'm sure will appear um, on future lists and have an opportunity uh, to potentially, you know, serve on this court or even serve on, on, uh, on, a, on a federal court. Um, I'm, I'm sure of that. So uh, I think it's going to be exciting to see what the, what the court is able to do. And really, it's an honor for me to be able to play a part in being able to shape a part of, of Florida's history. And so uh, this will be written in the years to come. Uh, I'm just confident that the three folks I put on there are people that are going to do it um, at a very high intellectual level, and I think they're going to do it with honor and integrity, and that's really all you can ask. So uh, I celebrate the three justices. I thank you guys for allowing me. I thank you guys for allowing me to be here. and. Um, my rundown of that process, if there happens to be uh, a Supreme Court vacancy any time at the U.S. level, I guarantee you it will not be that smooth and it will be very, very contentious. And so we were able to put three folks on, I think, in a way that, 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 was, that was good. 
and I'm glad that there wasn't any you know, major, major problem. So I, I think there's a lot of people here that were involved in this process, and um, I thought it went really, really well. I didn't know what to expect going in, uh, but I think you could probably conceive of worse ways to be able to do judicial selection. So I got to go back and dry off the kids and put them to bed, <laughs> but I want to thank you guys for having me, and uh, welcome Ted Olson to Florida. I know Ted is always a, a, a great, uh, great speech and a wealth of information, and I just want to wish you guys all a very, very pleasant evening. Thank you all. Take care. Governor DeSantis, thank you for joining us. Uh, I knew who you were going to appoint, and I didn't tell anybody. So I'd like to be on the District Court of Appeal if we could work that out. Uh, also, I waved at you at the fair at 6.30 this morning, but you didn't notice me. Uh, let, me let me, before we break for dinner, let me introduce formally and recognize here Chief Justice Kennedy. Would you stand? <laughs> Justice LaBarga. Justice Polston. <laughs> Justice Lawson. <laughs> cute, cute trick. Uh, doesn't want the others to be seen, apparently. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you do it. Can you turn the floodlight toward Justice Lagoa? I'll do uh, Justice Lagoa, where are you? <laughs> Justice Munoz, where are you? And Justice Luck. And if I might also recognize uh, just retired Justice Grimes. <laughs> Justice Harding. <laughs> Justice Kogan. <laughs> Justice Wells. Justice Bell, <laughs> Justice Anstead, <laughs> and Justice Perry. <laughs> this is the risk you take when you miss someone, but they're not on the court anymore, so I, I, I didn't miss anyone, did I? former justice. Uh, let me ask the District Court of Appeals judges to rise and be recognized, and the circuit judges and the county judges. And for, finally, before we break for dinner, for those of you who aren't aware of it, seven Florida judges were approved by the United States Senate Judiciary Committee to be on the U.S. District Court. And two of them are present, Judge Wendy Berger from the District Court of Appeal. And I know he's here, Judge Alan Windsor. <laughs> Did I, are any of the other five here? All right, let us break for dinner. Thank you very much.